Good morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Palo Alto, where we come to transform ourselves and each other and the world. It is so good to be together. I encourage you to turn your video on for the whole service and scroll through the gallery view now and then to see each other's faces. We'll keep the audio off for most of the service, but just for now, let's uh, unmute ourselves so we can hear each other say hello. 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 Good morning. Hello. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hello. 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 <laughs> hello. Hello. Nice to see other people's faces. All right. <laughs> you can see the order of service by following the link in the chat, and there's lots of information there about events coming up. I want to call your attention to a few things. Um, one, the Hotel de Zinc sign up is there. That is our rotating uh, homeless shelter. We host it here for the month of September, and you can sign up to bring a meal um, for 15 folks one of those evenings. So follow that link um, to sign up now. September's around the corner. Um, also, this afternoon, I hope you can join the solidarity vigil around, uh, surrounding. First United Methodist in support downtown. Uh, again, follow the link for information. And uh, speaking of um, showing up for racial justice, the Beloved Conversations virtual program um, closes its registration this Tuesday. So um, follow that link too if that's something you've thought about. And finally, very importantly, uh, we are starting in-person services outdoors at 9.30 on September 12th, if the smoke stays away and all goes well. So um, lots of information about that if you follow the link in the order of service and more information um, coming this week with all the details you will need to uh, pre-register and attend. The other important thing to know is that on that day, September 12th, this online service continues completely unchanged except at 11 o'clock and that we will resume our 9 30 11 o'clock schedule um, from here on out as again if covid and the weather permit <sighs> and now let us begin our service words from the English Quaker George Fox are both a piece of wisdom from our living tradition and a lovely accompaniment for our lighting of our chalice. So we will have our chalice lighting and centering words together. If you have a chalice there with you or any kind of candle, please light it along with me.
Mind the light of God in your consciences, which will show you all deceit. Dwelling in it guides out of the many things into one spirit, which cannot lie nor deceive. Those who are guided by it are one. As we follow the sound of the bell into silence, let us become centered and fully present in this time and place together. Now let's join Bruce in singing, Wake Now My Senses. Wake now my senses and hear the earth call. Feel the deep power of being in all. Keep with the web of Now is the time we set apart aside in our services in order to hear the important events of one another's lives. Let our awareness of the joys and concerns of the wider community enter this sacred space and um, share together as, as a sacred community. So if you have a joy or a sorrow that you would like me to share this morning, please send it to joyconcern at uucpa.org. You can also do that during the week and I will keep track of them for the service coming. Um, and uh, you can also post them right now in the chat box provided by Zoom. I'll share them all aloud. I'd like to begin by, um, by acknowledging and holding in, in our grief the almost 200 people uh, killed in the bombing of the Kabul airport in Afghanistan this week, including many U.S. service people um, who were um, often sharing with their families up until hours before their death um, 
their, their joy and gratitude at helping people to safety. We grieve with their families. bread with words by the 19th century Universalist minister Phoebe Ann Coffin Hannaford. to tell you this, mo this morning, and I, I do so with great trepidation because, you know, all those stuffies are a really tough act to follow, but please have patience with me as I do my best. This is a story of Kubera, the god of wealth in Hinduism. He's also, um, he's also uh, a very important god to, um, to Jains and Sikhs. And um, Kubera has an interesting history. Um, he kind of started out in, his, in the first tales as kind of a bad guy and eventually became recognized as the treasurer of the gods. He's fabulously wealthy. And I'm sorry to say this because the way he looks shouldn't matter, but um, the way that um, many, many old storytellers from many, many cultures signaled that somebody was undesirable in some way was making them look um, a, it, what that, that culture considered unattractive. So just to convey that idea, I want you to know that um, he had very few teeth, Kubera. He, um, he had one eye. There's a whole story about how one of his eyes got put out in an accident, so it was sort of strange looking. And um, he's very, very, very short. And also, he had three legs. All right. So all that's to tell us that this god of wealth, the treasurer god, is a little different than most of the gods who are supposed to be very beautiful. So um, Kubera, as I said, was very wealthy. He had a palace full of beautiful furnishings and all the best servants taking care of him and his guests and uh, all everything made of gold and encrusted with jewels. And, you know, it wasn't enough for him to, um, to have this wonderful palace and all these riches. He wanted people to know. So he thought, well, I'll throw a big feast and I'll have a lot of guests and they will, uh, it will cost me a lot to, to feed them and have the cooks hired and buy great food and everything, but they'll all see my, my beautiful palace. So I'm going to invite them to a feast. And mm, what I really want to do, he thought, is invite some gods. 
so they'll see just how marvelous my home is. So Kubera went to, to Shiva and Parvati and said, I'm having a feast, will you come and be my guests of honor? And Shiva and Parvati said, well, um, yeah, we're busy, uh, we can't make it, but um, you know, our son Ganesha would love to come. Uh, he loves food and he'll enjoy the feast. And um, Kubera thought, mm, okay, maybe he was thinking, well, Ganesha will tell them how fabulous my, host, my, my house is. So he says, sure, I'll, I'll bring little Lord Ganesha along with me. And uh, Shiva said, I should warn you, He's got quite an appetite. Kubera said, oh yeah, well, I know, I know kids, I know little boys, he's probably gonna eat quite a lot. Come on with me, Ganesha, come to my, come to my feast. So Kubera and Ganesha went back to the palace and Ganesha sat in the place of honor at the feast and he began to eat. Oh my goodness, could he eat. Everything, everything on his plate disappeared just like that. Is there any more? His plate is filled up. Still not satisfied, he started taking things from all over the table until all the dishes were empty and taking things from all the dishes of all the other guests until finally they said, uh, I guess the feast is over for us, and they left. Not Ganesha. He sat there and said, anything else to eat? Kubera thought, wow, he really, he really can eat, but he wanted to impress the gods, so he said, uh, hold on, my, my, my cooks are working at it, Lord Ganesha. Ganesha was impatient. He said, no, 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 no. I, I can't wait for them to make more food. So he just started eating the raw ingredients, the uncooked rice and, and the dry lentils and all the fruits and vegetables that were ready there. Isn't there any more, he said, and he just started eating the plates and the bowls, gold and jewels and all. And then he started eating the furniture. Kubera was quite distressed by this point and said, Lord Ganesha, I, I, I don't know what to do for you. And Ganesha said, well, you better come up with some more food or I'm going to eat you next. This is when Kubera thought he really needed some help. So he said, hold it right there. And he ran back to Shiva and Parvati and found them. And he said, I'm trying to feed your son and I don't know what to do. He's eaten everything. Shiva said, here's, I think, what you need to do. Just give him this, but give it to him in a spirit of humility, a spirit of love. And he gave Kubera just a modest bowl full of the plainest food, puffed rice. He said, try that. But again, think about how you give it to him. Kubera thanked him and rushed back to his palace. And he bowed low before Ganesha and said, my Lord, I have one more thing for you to eat, and all I wish is for you to be satisfied and happy. And in that spirit of humility and love, he gave him this modest, modest food. And Ganesha, who had eaten and eaten and eaten, ate the puffed rice and said, ah, now I am satisfied. Now I have had enough. And Kubera also was satisfied.
Beautiful. Last week, I spoke about time. You can catch that on our, uh, both the audio and the, um, the text on our website if you missed it. And next week, I'm going to round out the series by speaking about work on Labor Day weekend. So today, I'm thinking about money. And if you're not familiar with the origin of the, uh, the phrase, the magic penny, all I was thinking about the song by Malvina Reynolds. Um, feel free to sing along if you know it. Love is something when you give it away, give it away, give it away. Love is something when you give it away, you end up having more. It's just like a magic penny. Hold it tight and you won't have any. Lend it, spend it, and you'll have so many. They'll roll all over the floor, etc. You know, I knew that song when I was a child, and even then it struck me as a little strange because it seemed like the purpose of the song was to convince me that, um, that love was not love, did not grow unless it was given away. And I felt like I already know that. I mean, even as a child, when I couldn't have articulated it, I had this sense, well, well love is relational. Love, love isn't love until you give it away. That's what love is, is an interaction between people, a giving uh, freely. And, um, but money, is money like that? I mean, I don't have any magic pennies. And are the pennies that we do have magical? Really, the song is, is sort of saying, They'd have to be in order to work like love, like money doesn't work that way usually. But I like the thought of the song maybe inspiring us to think of money a little bit more like love. Love is not a zero-sum game, right? I give away love, I have more. That's, that's what love is. The more people and, and, and beings that I love, the more love is in my life. But, um, but money, we're told that, unless it happens to me magical, money is zero sum. I give it away, I have less, and the person I gave it to has more. That's just the way it works. And um, the song says we could, we could spend it, well sure, then I get something in exchange. Or uh, we could lend it, lending it is great, but you know, eventually the money gets paid back, and then it, if I lent you money, then in the end, you have less, or maybe if I lent it to you interest-free, you have the same amount you started with, and I have more, or at least the same amount I started with. You know, money doesn't seem to work like love. It, there's only so much to go around, and if I have more, you have less, and vice versa. So what would it be like if we treated money more like a magic penny. Could we imbue it with that magic? The magic that love and friendship naturally possess. Maybe money possesses that magic too. Well, the major religions of the world seem to think so because everyone I know of has some version, um, along with the golden rule, of um, the principle that you should give away a chunk of whatever comes your way. Whatever money and property comes to you, you just give it. You don't lend it, you don't spend it, only you give it away. Not as an investment, just a gift. No strings attached, nothing transactional, just like love. And yet, it does come back around in, in certain well-studied and documented ways especially if we don't lend it or spend it, but just give it away. For example, a study reported in Nature shows that spending money on ourselves makes us less happy than spending it on others. We're actually going to feel better if we give that money away than if we just buy something that we want. So maybe the next time that we're moved to engage in a little retail therapy, we could try charity therapy instead, just, just to see how that goes. Now the researchers show, and again, there's a lot of research on, on the practice of generosity and how it affects us. 
They show that some ways of giving uh, give us extra boosts. For one thing, it has to be done freely, not coerced. Okay, it's, you're, it's a gift. Again, it's not a transaction. It's not anybody's leaning on you and you're trying to relieve yourself of some pressure. You just want to give something, and you do. That gives you an extra boost of happiness. So does proximity, nearness to um, the people we're giving to. Uh, we might not know them personally, but if they are connected to us in some way, we can identify, um, say, for example, they live in our community. It makes us extra happy to give to them, as opposed to um, some very far away uh, cause. And being able to see the results of our generosity gives us a big bounce. We want to know that our giving is making a difference, that our pennies are working some magic out in the world. I guess that shouldn't be surprising. What might be more surprising is what a powerful effect letting go of what, what comes our way has on the much wider community, that is on the economy, the national, even the worldwide economy. Again, there's ample study that shows that greater economic equality drives econo <coughs> economic growth and prosperity for everybody. Greater economic equality, when the money has been spread around, given out of the hands of the people who have a lot, into the hands of people who formerly had very little. For example, research by the International Monetary Fund shows that greater inequality in an economy causes greater economic instability. The, country, uh, the country's economy fluctuates in scary ways. Its growth spells tend to be shorter when its income equality is high. And then, of course, with, you know, organizations, we already know we give to them because of what they do for the community. That's, that's why we choose certain charities, um, because we see the effects and we think, oh, I, I want to make a difference to, to the environment. So I'll give to this environmental organization, to homelessness, and here's an organization that is housing people. We see that, on the whole, our community becomes better when we give it away, some of what we have. But then to see also from, from organizations as conservative as the International Monetary Fund, no less, that when those of us with more wealth hold on to it, the economy stagnates. And when we keep it moving, passing it along in ways that increase others' wealth, the economy thrives. It turns out that generosity is the tide that truly lifts all boats. As I said, this is a little countercultural in, uh, in our dominant culture here in the United States, where what we hear all the time is that the more we give away, the less we have. But we do have contrary teachings all around us, countering that zero-sum narrative about money. The Native American folklorist and scholar uh, Joseph Bruchak says, the potlatch ceremonies found among many of the native peoples of the Pacific Northwest have been referred to as fighting with wealth by anthropologists who describe them as ceremonies in which a prominent figure tries to outdo a rival by either giving away or destroying vast amounts of personal possessions. Bruchak says, it could be said that while the accumulation of personal wealth is a desirable social norm in mainstream American culture, just the opposite is true in American Indian cultures. At its best, the potlatch was a way to redistribute material wealth rather than leaving it in the hands of a few. He uses the past tense. The potlatch, of course, is not entirely gone, I'm happy to say, but it was made illegal by the government of Canada for many years, which had quite a damping effect on the people of the Pacific Northwest. It's not only a, a cultural phenomenon and a way for some people to give away their wealth. For many Indian nations, the potlatch, uh, for, for example, the Haida, the potlatch has been the main instrument of economic organization, governance, and law. 
we know that our economy has thrived when it has emulated practices like these. Okay, so you might be thinking, Amy, we're talking about giving stuff away, and now you're talking about what we get back. Doesn't that kind of hmm, taint the generosity a little? It kind of gives us mixed motives, right? Well, yeah. When we give money away, our motives tend to be mixed. Um, maybe they're mixed when we give love away, too. Let's not worry about it. Motives usually are. We have a lot of them all mixed together. And oh, with money, it's so entangled with so many thoughts and feelings and fears and hopes, really intense experiences like pride and shame and status and failure and success desires of all kinds, all wrapped up in what we do with our money. The important thing here is to realize that money, like love, is relational. And sometimes to discover that, we might do well to, to give it away. Maybe, like Kubera, we'll start out kind of having ulterior motives but we'll discover simple generosity along the way. I want to propose an exercise, and I'll, I'll help us all carry it out with some um, reminders um, over the coming weeks. In a few days, when, um, when the end of the month um, has rolled around, um, a lot of us will be getting some kind of check, uh, a paycheck, um, a social security check, some kind of um, deposit comes our way, putting a little more money into our possession um, around the turn of the month. So I'd like to propose that whatever that figure is, whatever the gross amount on that check is, you give away 1% of it. Just give it away. Now, I want to be careful of my own mixed motives here, so to keep them as close as I can get to pure, I want to ask you to find someone or something to give to besides UUCPA. Plenty of fine people and organizations out there. Use that magic penny because I have faith that no matter whom you give to, it will. It will lift all boats. It will help you. It will help the people around you. It will help our wider community. It'll help UUCPA too. So. Don't give to UUCPA, give to something else, just 1%. Just 1% to see what it feels like. Now, um, and I'll send a reminder and give you a chance to, uh, to tell me what that was like, because I'm really interested to know. Just how does it feel? Is it hard? Is it a hardship? Um, what, what do you feel like while you're doing it? What thoughts come through your mind? Now, if it's really a serious hardship, if you just can't give away that much money, and I know some people are living on the edge, and that's a lot of money, 1% is a lot, please don't. Don't give it away. For example, if, if this is going to keep you from paying your rent or your car payments or paying for medicine or food, um, hold on to your money, okay? You need it. But there's lots of ways to still practice generosity, so I urge you to do that when I send out this reminder. Um, you can bring in a, neighbor, a, a neighbor's um, a, a trash and recycling bins in the morning. You can listen to someone uh, who just needs to talk when you're really feeling kind of in a hurry and impatient. Um, just with the people you live with, do someone else's chores um, without saying a word and, and, and just um, feel what that feels like. Just watch the movement of that generosity. Um, so that's for folks who really uh, would find it a hardship. If for you, giving away 1% is, um, raises qualms more about, um, you know, geez, you won't have as much spending money, you won't be saving as much or investing as much as you'd hoped. Um, you might feel like that's uh, a lunch or two out that you can't have or something you were going to buy for yourself that you can't. Um, I want to urge you to do it anyways. It's just an experiment. Just see how that, how that feels, 1%. And then the next month, uh, around um, the end of September, beginning of October, I'll send out a reminder 
and we'll try to triple that. Try to give away 3% of the gross uh, amount you have received in that, in that pay period there or with that, um, with that check. And see what that feels like, 3%. And yes, one more time, on November 1st, I'll send a reminder and we'll triple it again and give away 9%. Just to see what that's like. Now, a lot of you I know are already giving away um, a, a significant chunk and, and this is on top of that. Just, just for these three times, 1%, then 3%, then 9%. Something interesting to do as that happens might be um, not only to watch your own thoughts and feelings, but to imagine that money traveling around like magic pennies. What will the recipient or recipients do with it now? Where will it go? How will their lives be different and, and the lives of people around them and the broader community? Watch in your imagination as the money travels. And notice if the way you feel about it and what you think about it and the way it travels is different depending on who the recipient is. I know for some people this is going to be a few dollars. For some people it's going to be a hundred dollars. Whatever's one percent for you and then on up. There's also ways to give um, at that moment and through our month that just build upon the experiences that we have moving money around almost every day. One of the researchers on generosity and, and happiness, Dr. Elizabeth Dunn, gave an example of something that occurred to her. She says, I think every time we start to look out for ourselves, we can potentially ask, is there some way that I could use whatever I'm doing right now to help others as well. So for example, she says, I was actually at a conference just as the COVID outbreak was beginning, and I went to the drugstore store to get hand sanitizer for myself, but I decided to buy about another 50 bottles. And I just gave it out to everybody for free because I realized that this was just a small thing that I could do. It didn't cost that much. It wasn't that hard. See, generosity doesn't have to hurt. But this too can be part of the experiment. How does it feel to give when you think, oh, that, that's not difficult at all? How does it feel to give when the giving feels like a stretch? Just to watch how that is. There are no right answers. I, I don't know what will happen. I'll be doing this experiment along with you. I'd like us to try it together because one thing is sure, generosity is one of the spiritual gifts that we come to church to develop. So here's our chance. I think every, every culture, every religion has complex attitudes about money. Kubera um, is not the only God associated with money in Hinduism and other Indian religions. In fact, he contrasts, interestingly, with another Hindu god um, who has to do with money, Lakshmi. You could say that Kubera equals wealth, all pooled in one place, and Lakshmi is about prosperity. At her festival, Diwali, people give each other gifts, a demonstration of faith that prosperity is not a zero-sum game. This isn't a moment to hold on to one's wealth. This is a moment to give it away. And trust, it'll all keep moving, and you'll have plenty. Now, some prayers to these gods are strictly transactional, uh, transactional or they seem it on the surface. Say this mantra, to um, Kubera, or Lakshmi for that matter, and prosperity will come to you. But these different gods exemplify different faces of money, and so Kubera, the treasurer who holds all wealth, well, literally, his face is ugly. As I said, that's kind of a problematic way to think about, about morality, but it's deep in many cultures. 
And I think that what it's saying is that's kind of an unattractive way to deal with the wealth that comes your way. Lakshmi, on the other hand, loves clean homes and beauty, and she comes to the places where wealth is flowing, where people are giving one another gifts, where they're passing on that magic penny, things of value, just the way they pass on love, because that's the way it works. Now, as with time that I talked about last week, our attitudes about money tend to be dominated um, by a feeling of scarcity. There's just not enough. There's never enough. We could always want more. And as with time, it's true that money is not infinite. It's, it's complicated. It's, it's different because it can grow um, the goods available to us as people, all people, can, can increase. But let's just take as an axiom that your money is not unlimited, okay? It has limits. And so, as I was saying about time last week, you can decide, given that my money is not infinite, what is the most important way for me to use it? What do I want my legacy to be? What do I want to happen around me? And because of the way I use the money that comes my way. Because I want each of us to emerge from this experiment of ours, to emerge from our life as a community and, and our spiritual journey that we carry out together here, knowing, first of all, what it feels like to be generous. I mean, even more generous than you are right now. I, even more generous than you're thinking. What it feels like to be more and more generous. And second, I want us to emerge from this experiment knowing something about how to grow our own generosity. I want us to live large, to be more than we are right now. It's what I want for myself. It's what I want for you. The way love expands who we are, makes us more than we were before. I wonder if we can do that with generosity. As I said, I don't know. Let's try it and see. Let's try and see. George Fox, whom we heard before, said, let us see what love can do. And maybe our money can be love in action. Let us see what generosity can do for ourselves, for those we love, for the whole world, and tell each other what we discover. So appropriately now, I turn to thoughts of our offering. We create this space together, not out of wood and glass, nor even out of electricity and binary signals. We create it out of our presence, our sharing, our time, our life energy together. Wherever we are today, we have chosen to be together, hoping that Together, we can do so much more to make our lives into all that we dream of and make our world into the one we hope to see. So, in that experiment, as I said, I don't want you to be thinking about UUCPA, but always when we come together, we have a bit of a practice of generosity. If we're moved by gratitude to each other in being here together and all we do, we may choose to support with whatever financial resources we can this community that we're creating and that is creating us. And so the offering will now be given and received. The order of service gives a QR code and link and also information on using text to give via Give Lively. And here's your moment. If you didn't see my notice in the chat, if you um, have a moment to think 
can you figure out the connection between Veronica's choice in mu of music and the theme today? I'll give you a prize. Okay, the prize is just a laugh. Give it a try. <laughs> Thank you. And the answer to the quiz is all of the composers today are Baroque. Broke? Broke? Get it? Okay, if you can still stand to be in the room with me after that, um, please join in as Bruce leads us in singing We Are Not Our Own.
liturgies of care. Let us be a house of welcome, living stone upholding living stone, gladly showing all our neighbors we are not our own. In the words of that beautiful hymn, by the light of the chalice this morning, we have shown one another something more of who we are. So we extinguish the flame, but we take that new wisdom with us. May we go forth from our gathering knowing just a bit more about who we all are and show it to all we meet with love, humility, and gratitude until we gather together again. Something has happened to my Zoom session. I have Zoom muted. You shouldn't be able to hear my Zoom.
Yeah, I've lost control. Now, of please stay after the benediction for our virtual coffee time. You'll be invited to small group conversations in well, our breakout rooms. I can't shut down or Facebook you can and stay I can't here shut in the main room with Zoom, me so I'm to discuss log the out service. And log back in and see what this happens. is also a great time I'm to gonna watch wait until out she's done. for uh, John Wright, our new membership and engagement coordinator. He Just would in love case to get to know you. Up. And um, if you're new, he's particularly looking for you so that he can guide you um, into activities at UUCPA and answer your questions. So let him know that you're new and you can have a good chat. The rooms will stay open for about half an hour. So now please unmute yourself and touch hands virtually like this while we say our benediction together. Go out into the world. Go out into the world in peace. 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 Go out into the world in peace.